County, I want to thank all of you for coming. I have just a couple of quick things I want to say about why we decided to do this. We wanted to get the candidates all up here so people could obviously have a chance to meet them in mass. But what I'm actually am hoping for is after tonight's event, you will find a candidate that you will support, knock doors, make calls. And then after the August primary, you will continue that support for the candidate. Your dedication to that candidate could be the driving force that gets family, friends, and co-workers to the polls. What I am hoping is that we have such a successful voter turnout that on the morning of November 7th, Wisconsin is mentioned on MSNBC, CNN, and maybe even Fox and Friends. District 10 can do it, we can do it everywhere. <laughs> we are very honored tonight to have Joy Cardine. She has recently retired after 31 years at Wisconsin Public Radio, not as the flyer says, Wisconsin Public Television. So Joy, thank you. Thank you. really nice to be here. This is my own stomping grounds. I'm from, I'm from Appleton. And thanks to the Democratic Party of Outagamie County and Winnebago County for organizing the forum. Thanks to the candidates who are participating tonight. And most of all, thanks to you for, for coming because this is a big deal. This is, um, this is important. You're here or you're watching on Facebook Live or Wisconsin Eye because you care, because you want to be involved, because you want to be an informed voter, and I hope that this forum will help you make up your mind. I've, um, I've moderated candidate forums before, but never ten candidates at a time. This is, gonna, this is going to be tricky. Um, because we have so many candidates, we are going to have to have some strict time limits on, on our answers. So you will, uh, candidates, be told if you get a two-minute response or a one-minute response, we have a uh, trusty timekeeper who will, you will see that screen green as you have as much time as you want to talk. When it turns yellow, it means wrap it up, you've got 15 seconds. When it turns red, it means put a period on it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we want to get to as many um, questions as possible. And we are going to forego opening statements. Uh, so we can, uh, we can hear from more of you on more questions. The candidates were asked to tweet their answer to the first question, who are you and why are you running? And you can search the hashtag DemGovGab to, to read the answer. And uh, we are also going to forego um, formal introductions, though you will see that the candidates are seated in alphabetical order from uh, your left to right. I will say, though, that we have Michelle Doolin, Tony Evers, Matt Flynn, Andy Bronick, Bob Harlow, Mike McCabe, Milan Mitchell, Kelda Royce, Kathleen Weinhout, and Dana Walks. And thank you very much for being The first question you get two minutes each. Everybody will answer this question, though everybody will not answer every question because of uh, the time limitation. Governor Walker delivers his State of the State address next week. And you get to uh, beat him to it. Uh, how do you describe the state of the state of Wisconsin in one or two words, as is the custom, and then preview your own State of the State address that you will give next year if you win? What are the first three pieces of legislation or policy that you are going to call for that you will make your priority in your first 100 days in office? And we'll, we'll start with Michelle. You don't have to turn it over. Okay. Um, first three pieces of legislation um, redrawing voter district um, boundaries to be nonpartisan. Um, to get rid of the, uh, or at least to mitigate the voucher school system in favor of 
better funding for public schools once again, and to raise minimum wage to $15 an hour in the state of Wisconsin. The state of the state is what in your, in your opinion? It is stacked against a dying middle class, and we need to better our differences have become more important than our common humanity, and that's been fed by the, the, the pot stir that is working in Madison, the legislation, and our governor. There's no rule that says you have to take all every second, so you're just about done. Um, let's move on to uh, Tony Evers. Uh, the state of the state is what, and what are your um, three priorities in your first 100 days in office? The state of the state is um, not to focus on personal uh, accomplishments by a governor, but rather to uh, talk about issues in a positive vein to kind of lay out the vision for the future in a positive way. Uh, too many times it is all about me as governor and what I have accomplished I want to make sure that uh, uh, it's about a positive vision for the future. First three, first three things that I would, uh, would do as governor is take the Medicaid money. We've left that sitting on the table for, uh, uh, for seven years and having Medicaid money in the state of Wisconsin to, to increase the uh, options and availability of high quality health care will take an immediate, uh, immediate bounce. The second thing that I would do is uh, meet with Republican legislators and get a deal on uh, uh, transportation issues in the state of Wisconsin with a transportation plan that not only focuses on three-lane highways and four-lane highways to Foxconn, but also fi fixing potholes across the state of Wisconsin. And the third thing I do would do is to call for the legislature to make the secretary of the Department of Natural Resources uh, back to the future to be an appointee of a independent board where we can start to listen to scientists and also get get ourselves geared up to fight the issue of, of high quality clean water in the state of Wisconsin, whether it's in Kewanee County or Milwaukee uh, County with uh, with uh, pipes and uh, uh, lead uh, being uh, consumed by young young kids to. Uh, farms in Kiwani County and, and, and uh, in the central sands of the state. Water is a huge issue for a state. We have to have an independent PNR. I'm sorry, I just saw the yellow exclamation point. All right, um, same question. Thank you, and if I may, I'd like to stand up. Um, the first thing that I would say to the people of Wisconsin is that a new day is dawning with a new administration. And I'm a positive person, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time denigrating what's happened, but this administration for seven years has undone 100 years of progressive tradition in the state. And I would put an end to it. And here are the three things that I would do initially. And it depends on whether it's a compliant legislature and the Supreme Court has redistricted, or it could be a, uh, in my view, a, a gerrymandered illegitimate legislature like we have now. But the first thing that I would do is I would get leg uh, legislation passed supporting me to bring litigation to stop this Foxconn deal. This Foxconn deal is absolutely corrupt and is emblematic of everything wrong in this administration. Four billion dollars to this Chinese company to come in and essentially pollute our water, um, to take use eminent domain to throw people out of their homes, uh, that's not gonna happen under me. That is simply not going to happen, I'm gonna stop it. The second thing that I would do is a basket of labor issues. I would get rid of right to work, get rid of Act 10, and put back in prevailing wage. And the third thing I would do would be to open up Badger Care to all. Because we have a corrupt Trump administration, but there are certain things we can do. And the truth of the matter is that health care is a right. It shouldn't depend on some single woman going in with two kids. It shouldn't depend on how much money she has in her purse and whether she gets a mammogram. That's just plain immoral and wrong. And the things that I can do would be to go back in and get that billion dollars that this uh, governor of ours turned back. But secondly, badger care for all. And if somebody has some money, they're going to pay a good premium. And if they want Cadillac, they can buy themselves a nice supplement. 
But the truth of the matter is, those are the first three things. Get rid of Foxconn, get rid of this anti-labor stuff, better care for all. Thank you. Did you just get 10 seconds of my time? Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll try that again, and I will see. Andy Gronick is next. Don't push that button. <laughs> okay, I'm Andy Gronick. Um, so the state of the state, let's keep this simple. Last. Last. How many things have we last at? Really, the state of Wisconsin. We're last at creating and starting new businesses. We're near last on roads. We're almost first on putting people in prison. Think about it. Okay, state of the state when I'm governor? First. Because you have to aspire to be first and have real plans to make that happen. So my plan's pretty simple. We need good paying, family sustaining jobs. I spent 35 years helping struggling companies that couldn't go out and get a bank loan, for the most part, to solve problems and move forward and create good paying jobs. That skill set's gonna come in very, very handy in a state where we have people who are suffering, working two, three, four jobs, and no real plan for economic development. But we can build on strengths in the state of Wisconsin. We're great at growing food, processing food, packaging food, we have all of that infrastructure. Fresh water, clean air, sustainable en or renewable energy. All of those things are industries that will create jobs in science, technology, manufacturing, and agriculture, and that's who we are. Schools, very simple. We have a tradition of education in our state, and our public schools will be the very best choice for kids throughout our state. It doesn't matter where you live, you are entitled to a great public school education and we'll get back to that with me as governor. Third, I have Crohn's disease. Anybody here who feels at risk of losing your health care, I get it. My entire family's on Obamacare. Health care, affordable access to health care is a right. Period. <laughs> you took 10 seconds of life. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Harlow. Uh, the, the word, first of all, I used to describe it as hopeful. Um, and I would say ready. Ready uh, to compete in many different industries on the national stage, ready to thrive and achieve the kind of prosperity uh, that the people of Wisconsin are, in some ways, uniquely capable of achieving. Uh, the people of Wisconsin, I know this, I'm a third generation Wisconsinite, uh, are open minded are some of the most welcoming uh, and inclusive uh, people of anywhere in this country. And uh, those qualities have uh, helped us lead our nation in new technologies and research at our world-class universities for many years. Three of my grandparents uh, were professors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out how to take those world-class technologies and turn them into world-class businesses that create good-paying jobs. Uh, because Wisconsin is dead last in new startups, and that's wrong. And so what we need to do is have more resources for uh, professors to take these technologies they develop and then go and develop them in strong Wisconsin businesses. Uh, we need to have a public health care option for Wisconsin. Um, we can provide better quality, lower cost health care, and it's just wrong that we're not. So many Wisconsinites need better health care, need better quality health care, and we're going to deliver it and pass a public option for Wisconsin. Badger care for all. And the third is, you know, and this is really why I see this election being about, we need to come together as Wisconsinites. As I travel our state, the message I hear from voters is clear, and that is it is time for Scott Walker's politics of division to end. And we will end it in 2018. We're not going to let politicians like Scott Walker divide us anymore. We're going to come together and achieve the vision of prosperity for Wisconsin that we share. I'm Mike McCabe. Uh, Wisconsin is slowly but surely becoming a shadow of its former self. Uh, 
This is a state that once was known from coast to coast as a beacon of clean and open and honest government, and we have watched our political culture poisoned. This is a state that used to be an industrial powerhouse. Now we lead the nation in shrinkage of the middle class, and we have levels of economic inequality in our state not seen in Wisconsin since the Great Depression. And if we're going to turn that around, I think the first step I take as governor is to lead by example. I will not move into the governor's mansion if elected. I will not accept the full salary of the governor. I will be paid $1 less than the average Wisconsin worker makes. And then my first order of business is to put together a state budget that stops feeding the rich, that stops trying to build a sturdy economy and a, and a healthy Wisconsin from the top down, and instead reflect priorities that aim to build that state from the bottom up and empower five and a half million people in this state to do more for themselves and for each other and for their families. And that means creating a living wage for every worker, health care for all, debt-free and affordable education for everyone, high-speed internet everywhere to every doorstep, every nook and cranny of our state. And it means putting Wisconsin on the road to becoming the first state in the nation to be fully powered by renewable energy. We are not even making a half-hearted attempt to compete in that race yet. We have to start by aiming high and, and making it our aim to become the first state in the nation to be fully powered by clean energy. That's the first order of business for the next governor of our state, is to put together that budget that reflects those priorities. Thank you. <laughs> Don't start my time yet. <laughs> Reclaiming my time, brother. Oh. Hello, everyone. My name is Malin Mitchell. I'm the state president of the Professional Firefighters of Wisconsin. I am still an active duty firefighter with the city of Madison. Been on a job 20 years. A lot of you I got a chance to meet during the recall. I ran for lieutenant governor in 2012 in the recall. Tom Bear was at the top of the ticket. I was lieutenant governor candidate. We gave him hell and now I'm back again because we're not going to quit. And I'll tell you, to answer your question, Joy, what comes to mind when I think of Governor Walker right now in the state of the state is that we are lacking opportunity in every part of the state, every corner of the earth, or the state of Wisconsin. Because a struggle is a struggle. Whether you're struggling in Rhineland, Wisconsin, Superior, Nina Manasha, Appleton, Kenosha, Racine, Beloit, you're struggling. If you're struggling on North Side of Walker or La Crosse, Wisconsin, a struggle is a struggle. So the first thing that I'm going to do, one thing we have to do is raise wages. And not just talk about raising wages, but raising everyone's wage. There is a statute where the governor actually can have the ability to raise wages and make a wage floor. we got a plan to do that. It's going to come out very soon. So we're going to wait, raise wages. Our governor will sit and talk about the unemployment rate being 3.2%. And he's going to say everything's working. But I'm here to tell you everything's not working. It is not working. When you have people struggling to live day to day, to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet, we need to raise wages. Next thing we're going to do is go to adequately fund education, put back to $1.6 billion that the governor took in 2012, and put it back into education. He says we, we're, he's putting more money in education right now. He took $1.6 billion in 2012 and put back $638 million. We're still short. It's like taking a knife, sticking it eight inches in my back, pulling it out four inches, and now I'm supposed to say thank you. That's not progress. <laughs> And last but not least, the one thing we're going to do, because we only got two minutes, is we have to make sure that every person in the state has adequate health care. Not just access to health care, but actually has health care. And we can do that. We can provide it. First thing we got to do, though, is we have to stop the bad stuff from happening. And I'm going to be that firewall, no pun intended, Period. in order to do that. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kel DeRoyce, and I'm running for governor because I want to restore opportunity and fairness to Wisconsin. When I think about the state of this state under our current governor, I feel disappointed, and I feel like Wisconsin has been left behind. And that's because every single decision that our current governor has made is about what's best for him, what's best for his political ambition, what's best for his donors, what's best for the billionaire corporations uh, that he kneels at their, at their feet. And that has to stop. I want Wisconsin to be like the place where it was when I grew up, a place of opportunity that had the best schools in the world, that took care of families, and where small businesses could thrive. At my first state of the state, 
we're going to say that Wisconsin is the very best place to raise a family and the very best place to grow a business. With my Families First package, we're going to make sure that families across the state have access to paid family leave and affordable child care, as well as great public schools no matter where in the state we live. As a small business owner, uh, after leaving the legislature, I know how hard it is to compete against these big corporations that are getting massive taxpayer giveaways. So my small business package is going to help ensure that businesses and workers, uh, regardless of who your employer is, are able to buy access to Badger Care and buy into a system that mirrors the Wisconsin retirement system. So everyone can start a business and take that risk or work for a small business like mine. These are the steps that are necessary to take if we want Wisconsin to be competitive again. And the last thing that I think we need to do is address our infrastructure. This is not just roads and bridges, although those are certainly critically important, but it's also things like mass transit and access to the internet. If we want to be a modern 21st century state able to compete, and if we want our businesses to succeed, we have to make sure that people and our infrastructure are taken care of. Thank you. I'm State Senator Kathleen Von Hout. I represent a district in western Wisconsin. I would say the state of Wisconsin right now is challenged. Challenges give us opportunity. When I think about one of our challenges, we are 18th worst of all the states in the nation with regard to wages. People have jobs, but they don't pay very well. There was just a report that came out today that had the savings in, of Wisconsinites at a 10-year low because people don't have money in their pocket. There's really only one bill that the governor can write and does write, and that's the state budget. The state budget is a huge document. It includes all different parts of state government. And for far too long, the governor and the Republicans have said, we can't do this because we don't have the money or we have to do horrible things like Act 10 because we don't have the money. I knew that was wrong, which is why I've written four alternatives to the governor's budget to show that we can do what we want to do. And I'll give you an idea of what that means. First of all, we need to fix health care. We need to have our own marketplace. We need to take the money from the federal government with regard to Medicaid, and we need to invest that money in mental health and addiction services all across the state, because right now there are way too many people in prison suffering from mental illness and addiction, and they need treatment, and they need their life back. We need to fix the things that have been broken, from infant mortality to Planned Parenthood. We need to put the money back into the budget for health care when it comes to direct services. We need to change the way we fund schools in this state which makes things fair for both urban and rural areas, something we can do with the money in the budget. And we need to fix infrastructure, and that means not just roads, roads and bridges, but it also means our natural resource infrastructure, like lead pipes. We need to hire back the scientists and put them to work saying climate change is real, and this is what we're doing about it. Good evening, folks. I'm Dana Watts. I represent Eau Claire in the state legislature. I think the state, the, the, the status of the state is poor. And the reason is that we have strayed. This government has strayed from what it once was. We used to be a state that believed in the Wisconsin idea. And what was that? That meant that legislation passed the building had to be beneficial to the most amount of people possible. That's what that meant. And where have we gone? I'm on the weeding board. I have fought this Foxconn deal to the face of Foxconn. We have evolved into a state that is a corporate welfare state, and that's not fair because our people aren't being taken care of and our people are being ignored. As governor, I will, I will make darn sure that we have BadgerCare uh, buy-in in terms of health care. Everyone in this state needs to have health care, and the federal government is not going to do it. The Republicans are sabotaging health care out there. We're going to invest in the middle class. We're going to roll back right to work. We're going to make sure collective bargaining is, in, is there for people to use so that they can protect their professions and they can protect their wages and protect themselves. And finally, we're going to take a hard look at what's going on in terms of business development. We are last in the nation 
last in the nation in, in new business development. Just in this area alone, you've lost three paper plants in the last several months. What was done about that? We got $3 billion for some company from another country. But we, we don't have the time or interest in investing in our own. Just think for a minute if we took $3 billion and invested it in people's businesses. You could have 10,000 businesses operated by Wisconsin people all over the state of Wisconsin, and each one of those businesses would have $300,000 of seed money, startup money. That's investing in people. That's investing in our people. And that's what I'm fixing to do as governor. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for those um, answers to the first uh, State of the State uh, question. Next question, um, one minute. Uh, Democrats are celebrating an upset in the special election in Wisconsin's 10th Senate District uh, yesterday. It's a Republican district that... Uh, <laughs> that voted heavily for President Trump in the 2016 election, but the uh, Democratic candidate defeated the Republican candidate by about 10 percentage points. Governor Walker tweeted, among other things, that um, the election results should be a wake-up call for Republicans. How significant uh, was the outcome of that election, in your opinion, and why are you the candidate uh, who Governor Walker should be losing sleep over. In other words, uh, uh, why are you the candidate who can defeat Governor Walker? And we're going to start on the opposite end uh, and with Dana Walks and, and move in the opposite direction. Thank you, Joy. I, uh, I, I, this, this is an admission. I'm an attorney. I tell people I'm an attorney, but I take medication for it. But, <laughs> but the functional reality is this. I've spent 31 years in the courtroom fighting massive corporations, fighting some of the biggest corporations that there, that there are, and some of the wealthiest people. We've strayed from the middle class. If you want a vibrant economy, you've got to make sure that the middle class has dispos disposable income, and you've got to make sure that the middle class is expanding. I think the message that these voters are telling, are sending to Scott Walker, is that it's time to invest in people in this state. People in this state. And that's what we're going to do. The message he's receiving now, suddenly he's parading around almost like a Democrat on some of the issues. Have you noticed that? Talk about a metamorphosis. But, you know, this is, the message he should be getting is that people have had enough. We see corporations getting $3 billion. Time's up. It's time for people. Thank you. After the 2016 election, I went on a journey to figure out why my own state rep lost and why so much my neighborhood voted for, for Trump. And what I learned talking with clerks and election judges and local people and looking at ward level data and physically counting new voter registrations in the courthouse was that popular wisdom is that people switch their vote in western and central Wisconsin. But what I learned is that a whole lot of people came to the polls for the first time, and that Trump motivated a lot of people, and Hillary got the motivated people, but didn't motivate a lot of other people. When I think about what Democrats need to do to win, I think they need to do, look at Patty's race, and is it a bellwether? Absolutely. <coughs> Patty won by having deep roots in the district, and by showing that local people working hard talking to neighbors can be big money. A whole lot of big money was poured into that race. Thanks People so. told me they got all kinds of direct mail, negative direct mail. Why can I do this? Period. Thank you. You'll have to check it out later. <laughs> well, I'm Kelda Royce, and I'm very, very excited by Patty Schachner's victory, and also by Dennis Degenhard, who uh, had a 25-point swing uh, from the last uh, the last race who ran for assembly. I think it shows the power of a good candidate, somebody who is willing to work hard and raise the money and knock on the doors and do the phone calls and will inspire other people to join her. What uh, what Patty did was not necessarily run on a national message, not run against Trump. People are already angry. 
But she said, this is what I'm gonna do for our community. She gave us hope, she gave us someone to rally around, and she did the work. And that's what we need in Governor Walker. He's had his chance to govern. We all know all the terrible things that he did, but ultimately we're not gonna beat him by just repeating the litany of horrible things that he's done to our state. We're gonna win by saying, here's my vision of bringing opportunity and fairness to the state. I've been a fighter all my life since I left law school uh, and graduated law school and became the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin. I've never been afraid to back away from a fight and I'm gonna win this one. Thank you. I think the SD10 race shows that uh, we're fired up. Um, I think we have a blue wave coming in the state of Wisconsin. Can you feel it? Yeah. Can you feel it? So I think uh, Governor Walker is running scared. And I'm a firefighter. We respond to those on the worst days of our, their lives. People on the worst days of their lives in the community. And when they're, they're at their worst, we have to be at our best. And we'll leave no one behind. So I believe I'm the best person suited because I'm going to bring it, bring a fight to them. I've never shied away from a good fight, and I'm not going to shy away from this. We need to fight like hell. We need to fight strong for everyone to have better health care. Make sure everyone has wages that are high, that they can afford to go out on a fish fry and be with their families, afford a vacation. We need to fight like heck so that we have a good educational system. And our greatest commodity is our children. I have a daughter that goes to UW Oshkosh and a son that goes to in eighth grade. So I'm gonna fight. We gotta believe in the capacity for change. They showed us up north in Hudson that they could do it. That means we can take that energy, we can take that passion, and we can do that all across the state. And I'm the one to bring people together and I'm the one to do that, period. There is tremendous hunger for a very different kind of leadership out there. There is no question about that. I want a new governor. Everybody up here wants a new governor. The fact that you're here tonight indicates to me that probably you want a new governor. But that goal actually aims too low. To get a new governor, we need a new politics. We have a government that ceaselessly caters to a wealthy and well-connected and privileged few and leaves the rest of us behind, we have to break free of the trap of that kind of old politics. We need a new politics that is not money driven. It is not a politics of greed. My entire life's work has been about trying to expose and break the grip of big money influence in our politics. That's why I am in this race, because we need a new politics that gives us a government that works for all of us and not just those at the very top. Patty's victory is very significant, and I think uh, the thing that is most significant about it is all the work that went in behind the scenes. I know how many people called from uh, to phone bank. I, I know uh, how many emails were sent out by all these different campaigns around Wisconsin. And together, uh, through those efforts, we got enough Democrats out to vote in that district that we won. And we can do that in every district every year, and, and we should, and we should do it this year. Uh, why am I the best candidate to be governor of Wisconsin? Uh, I have a background, I see where things are going technologically. My training is in physics, I have a physics degree from Stanford. Uh, I've worked for many different tech companies. So I, uh, I've written tons of computer code, I've had uh, provisional patents filed by Stanford's Office of Technology Licensing on intellectual property I developed. I know uh, the technologies that are going to drive Wisconsin's economy, and I know how to work together constructively with uh, smart people with diverse backgrounds and figure out how to do it. And that's what I'll do as governor. And uh, how much? You're just well, we're almost out, okay. So we'll stop. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even breathing this time. I want to ask the question now who out here thinks politics as usual is working? Raise your hand. Anybody? Politics as usual. Anybody think it's working? I don't think it's working either. I'm coming at this from the outside. We have a lot of great establishment candidates here. I'm not an establishment candidate. Governor Walker has proven three times in a row he's got a playbook to beat the establishment candidate. He does not have a playbook to beat me. He wants to talk about growing an economy. I spent 35 years helping people actually create good paying family sustaining jobs. Bring it on. Secondly, Patty. I donated to Patty. I sent a fundraising email out to Patty for Patty. I tried to recruit uh, uh, volunteers for Patty, and I knocked on doors for Patty. Last Saturday, one degree, and I'll tell you what I heard. I heard people who were ready to get out and vote. People who knew how important this race was, 
and they were going to take their friends to the polls. We are on a wave of change. We need the right candidate to get up against Scott Walker and to take him down. And I'll tell you, I am a former middle linebacker, and I know a lot about bringing opponents <laughs> down. I'm a Navy veteran, the only veteran in this race. Uh, when I was with the Sixth Fleet, part of our job was intercept Russian trips, ships that try to harass our aircraft carriers during flight ops and drag them away. There's nobody, nobody in this room who's going to take on Scott Walker more aggressively and more articulately than I. My wife Mary and three of our staff went up to Hudson to help Pat <coughs> Governor and make calls for about a couple of hours. And we went to West Bend to do that with Dennis Dagenhart. I was the chairman of this party for two terms. I united our party and I fought for this party. One of the key questions tonight, there's a lot of good people here and we we'll all support one another. Who do you want on the stage next October against Scott Walker to prosecute the case against him as aggressively and articulately as possible? I think I'm that person, but I will support anybody who wins. But when I win, if I win, I also expect their support. Thank you very much. I'm Tony Evers, I'm state superintendent, and I was up in northwest Wisconsin in the last week, so I'll take the credit for Patty winning. <laughs> Actually, Patty is an outstanding candidate, but there is something afoot here. Across Wisconsin, over the last three general elections, over a million people voted to increase taxes on themselves for the public schools. And half of those people voted for Donald Trump. I can tell you that education has threaded the needle between uh, Democrats and Republicans. We can get some of those Trump folks back worrying about education, as we can if, 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 uh, around the issue of natural resources and roads. The reason I'm the best candidate, I've won three statewide races. The last time I won 70% of the vote was 70 of 72 counties. And if that makes me a freaking establishment candidate, by God, let's make it happen, exclamation point. I just blame that I'm the shortest candidate in the race. <laughs> All right, so what sets me apart from Scott Walker. Why am I the person to beat Scott Walker? Look at me. Nobody's going to not know the difference between the two candidates up there. <laughs> Seriously. I'm here because I want, I respect democracy. I really do. And a less than 40% voter turnout is not a country or a state run by its people. So I'm going to trust the people of Wisconsin to participate, to show up and I want to generate as much interest as I can in this race because I want people to show up. And I'm going to trust you, you to make the decision who's the right candidate against Scott Walker. There are certain things I'm not willing to do in order to win. And playing by the old guard mentality and lying and representing myself as something that I'm not is none of that. I'm a regular person. And you know what? Our voice is the loudest voice in the democracy. Exclamation. Exclamation point. <laughs> um, thank you for those answers. We're going to now start in the middle with Mike McCabe and we'll uh, go in the opposite direction and around. One minute uh, answers for this question. How do you distinguish yourself, including your leadership style and ability, from other candidates running? I think one of the things that brought me to this race was looking around at our political system and I, I see too many people who are comfortable playing by the traditional rules, using the traditional playbook, operating within the political system as it currently functions and being comfortable with that. I see too many people who are at peace with the political culture as it is and I'm not comfortable with the political culture as it is. I think we have to shake up and transform a system that works only for a few and leaves so many people voiceless and without representation and then dooms us to an economy that enriches those at the very top and leaves so many people in Wisconsin behind. 
So my, my leadership does start with example. I think governors should be servants and not masters, and that is why I won't move into the governor's mansion if elected, and why I won't accept the full salary of the governor, but rather will be paid $1 less than the average Wisconsin worker makes. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'm different. I, I'm, I, I've given back to my community for the last 20 years. That's been my job. That's been, we have a mantra, all hands working. It means that everyone on scene is doing something to mitigate the incident. That every firefighter, whether Republican or Democrat, are doing something to make things better, to make things right, to make it better for that person in the community. Governor Walker has had eight years. He ran for president. God bless him for that. That didn't go so well. But he had eight years to bring us together. And all he's done is divide us. Urban versus rural, labor versus, labor versus non-labor, pitted families against each other. He's had eight years. Now he wants year nine, year 10, year 11, and year 12. So basically we are his plan B. We are his contingency plan. And we just can't accept that anymore in the state of Wisconsin. It's time for us to turn the page on the governor. It's time for us to get real leadership in the state. And I believe I'm the person to provide that leadership. We've got members all across the state, over 4,000 members in every corner of our state, from urban to rural, and I'm the person that they elect as their president over and over again. So I want to do the same thing, bring leadership to the state house, bring all hands working to the state house, and I want to lead the state in the right direction. I'm Kelda Royce, and I've spent my career fighting on the front lines on behalf of women and families. I'm a mother of two young daughters, and there's nothing more important to me than the future uh, for them and for all of our kids. That's why I'm running for governor, because I want them to grow up in a state that has opportunity and fairness. I have a long track record of achieving progressive policy success, not just for my time as a state legislator, and including uh, during Act 10, when I helped to lead the fight against Governor Walker's attempt to destroy collective bargaining rights, but also for my time as a law student when I worked on the Innocence Project and was able to pass criminal justice reforms through a very Republican conservative legislature. And certainly for my time at NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin when I helped to pass the first pro-choice legislation in the state uh, in several decades. And I did it with an anti-choice assembly. So yes, I'm a proud progressive Wisconsinite. I'm a common sense badger. I believe we can move the state forward just like we were on the forefront of a progressive movement 100 years ago, but I can get things done too. Thank you. So the answer to the last question, why you should vote for me. I won, and I'm the only one here who won in a contested partisan race, not once, but three times, in a district that voted three times for Scott Walker and once for Trump. Nobody else can say that here. How am I different as a leader? I have written every single week a column that talks about what people care about that's happening in Wisconsin. Every week I sit down and I think, the people sent me here to serve, what do they need to know? What's out there that nobody's talking about that I need to write about because the people need to know that? It's a matter of listening, bringing people in, asking for their ideas, and then figuring out the political system to make it work. We need a leader that brings people in, that listens, and then does the homework, works hard, and gets stuff done. I represent Eau Claire in the state legislature, and I, I come from a long, <coughs> life, a long life of public service. I, I remember the first day I became involved in politics, I was 10 years old, and my mother comes walking in, she says, what are you doing? And I'm sitting in the living room on a Saturday eating my cereal. I said, I'm 10, I'm eating my cereal, and I'm watching cartoons. <laughs> Next thing I knew, she said, no, nope, you're going to go down to the Democratic headquarters, you're going to lick stamps for Hubert Humphrey, and that's starting today. <laughs> I've been involved in this stuff. Mostly as a volunteer ever since then. Before I went to law school, I worked for Ted Kennedy. I ran four legislative uh, races. I helped run a congressional race. But for 31 years, I've been an advocate for people in the middle class and people trying to get into the middle class in the courtrooms. And I got elected to the legislature about five years ago. And when you get there, you realize that the same powerful interests 
that are calling the shots in the courtrooms and dominating our court system, they're running that building. I'm running to run them out of that building. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Michelle. Um, I don't have a political resume. My, my, my professional resume politically will not impress you, and I'm not sorry for that. Because from the outside looking in, there's a lot of things that need to be said that aren't being said for fear of political careers, right? So I'm just going to say them. And as governor, as a leader, it would be a job to bring everything to the table and to moderate and to cultivate ideas and change on behalf of the Wisconsin people first. And to mitigate a combative legislation and to unite Wisconsinites behind everybody else. I mean, we need to be behind each other. And that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Tony back at you. Um, anybody and all of us can bash Scott Walker all night if we want to. That's not going to win us any elections, and frankly, that's not leadership. I believe, and I just have to go back in time, my father was a physician. He ran a tuberculosis sanatorium in Sheboygan County. I learned social justice from him. He spent his time advocating not only for those tuberculosis patients, but also the workers at Polar Company who had silicosis because of the work they did and in front of worker compensation panels for his entire life. I learned that from him. I was born and raised in Plymouth, Wisconsin. I met my wife in kindergarten. I lived all across the state of Wisconsin. I believe in Wisconsin. I believe that the, that the rural Wisconsin and urban Wisconsin deserve a fair shake. I have a positive view about this. And also, I will tell you, leadership is about building relationships. It's no different than our kids in school and no different than with our adults, exclamation point. We have to build relationships in order to move the state forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I announced uh, for governor, the journalist tweeted out, uh, Matt Flynn is running for governor, what do you think? First tweet that came back said, I'm for him 100%. When he was with Green Bay, he threw for six touchdowns against the Lions. I'm a different kind of quarterback. I've had sailors under my command. I've been a party chairman. We need a strong leader in the state who knows what he's doing, or she's doing. And uh, we have divisions in our party. Bernie Hillary, resistance establishment. We have uh, divisions in the state, Republican, Democrat. But I think that a good leader leads by example, leads fairly, and leads honestly, and leads the right way. And I have shown myself in the past to have been that kind of leader, and I will be again. Thank you very much. Hi, Andy Grove again. So I'm not going to talk in hypotheticals. I spent 35 years parachuting in, typically to crisis situations where there were all kinds of problems to solve. And those problems weren't solved by attaching myself to one divided side or the other. It was solved by listening. It was solved by finding those good ideas. And I'll tell you right now, I am interested in the very best ideas for the state of Wisconsin. I do not care where they come from as long as they put the people of our state first, where they belong. Leadership is about having those conversations. I took these, these conversations to the factory floor. We walked that floor. We talked to the people who were confronted by it. We found the ideas. We put together a plan. A plan that could be executed, that you could measure, and you could know if you're moving forward, backwards, or sideways. We need to be able to execute like that in the state of Wisconsin. We have to solve problems by honoring the people in the room, finding that common ground. I'll do that. I'm traveling the state, all over the state, tens of thousands of miles already, finding that common ground with people so that we can move forward. Thank you. So I'm Bob Harlow. I believe the mark of a good leader is somebody who is constantly searching, researching, evaluating, being aware of the cutting edge in uh, government policy and business and science, and using that knowledge to make sure that Wisconsin is on the cutting edge, is on the forefront. Uh, I will go to meetings with uh, research professors at universities, with uh, leaders of different administrations in our government, uh, with fascination into how things are done, and with a hunger 
to make every department of our government, every initiative in Wisconsin work better for the people of Wisconsin. And uh, I will govern, not by ideology, because I'm not an ideological person, but by well-reasoned argument, uh, by being aware of how things are moving, but of comparative examples across all these different fields, to make sure uh, that we are, in fact, doing what serves the people of Wisconsin best. Thank you. Um, we're running a little bit behind, even though we are putting such restrictions on the answers. But we will get into some specific issues, one candidate at a time right now, one minute each. I'm sorry that we don't have enough time for everyone to answer every single question. If you um, disagree or have something significantly different to say on the issue, we might have another candidate or two weigh in. But for the most part, this is going to be each candidate gets a different question. Um, Michelle, starting with you. Do you think Wisconsin's public education system has suffered under Governor Walker's policies? And if so, how so? And what specific changes would you make? Uh, yeah, I believe the public education system has suffered under Walker. Uh, I was PTO president of my son's school um, until I started this race, and I can see it. Um, I, I think that we need to dump the voucher system, uh, aka welfare for the wealthy. Um, my mom was a low-income mom, uh, or low-income mom, single mom, and I was able to go to St. Gabriel School, a private school, on scholarship. So there is that advocacy there for people who need it, we should reserve the charity for people who need it, not for people who don't. Um, I'd like to encourage mutual advocacy between schools and their communities. As PTO president, our school has like 300 people. We raised $25,000 last year for various things through our fundraising last year and spent it all on the school. So I know the money's there for the schools and the community. If people know where it's being spent, people will get involved. Um, and we need to pay teachers like the professionals they are because that's what we need to do. They're taking care of our kids. Right? Let's, um, let's move on to uh, uh, Tony Evers. How would you encourage the next generation of entrepreneurs to start businesses here and stay here? It's a great question and we have to start out with Scott Walker talking about dividing and conquering and creating the atmosphere in the state where people don't want to come here whether they're entrepreneurs or not. We have to, we're last, or almost dead last in entrepreneurs, and we have to make sure that our economic development policy is one that focuses on Main Street operations, Main Street enterprises. It can't be, can't be all bailed out in the southeast Wisconsin and hope for the best that this, this, uh, this Hail Mary pass, uh, pass works. We have to make sure that our economic development money is used wisely, is used regionally, it's used to help business people get loans at banks. That's pr primarily what they're asking us for, is help getting those resources. It's not a handout. But those decisions should be made locally, using local financial institutions, and absolutely using, the, we also have to increase the amount of money that we have in venture capital in the state of Wisconsin, exclamation point. Very good. Well, this, uh, this question means something to me, too, as I drove in on, on the construction on 441 for Matt Flynn. Um, what would you do in the next state budget to fund transportation needs and road repair? Thank you. For you. And Matt, uh, you still have all of your time. Uh, or at least, I, but are we allowed to add something to a question? Well, we, we, if, if you significantly disagree, I'm trying to keep us on track right now. Maybe if you have something to add on one, you can take a tiny bit of your time. Right, let me come to you. Thank you. Um, right now, um, the debt service constitutes 20% of our transportation budget. It used to be about 7%. Scott Walker has simply ignored our roads. There are big stretches of highway uh, through Milwaukee and, and uh, Madison, but also elsewhere in the state, plenty of places where their policy is either neglect or debt, neglect or debt. I would, I would repair our roads and I would pay for our roads. I want to put aside the four billion in Foxconn and the, the billion in Medicaid that he turned down and the 800 million in train money. That alone approaches six billion dollars. We could put people to work at union wages repairing our roads. But what I would do would do it a combination. It's going to be user fees. So I don't do tolls. I, I do not like tolls. 
there have got to be some surcharges on trucks. A truck going down does a lot more damage to a road than a car. And it's going to have to be some of the gas tax, quite frankly. I mean, let's be blunt about it. It was frozen in 2005. We may not put a full restoration of indexing, but it's going to be partly that as well. I will pay for our roads. There will not be debt and there will not be neglect. Is there anybody that has something, does anybody disagree that the gas tax should not be increased or um, uh, indexed so it uh, raises with inflation? Everybody here thinks that we should raise the gas tax, okay. Um, let's move to... Um, I was going to say, I would think we should look at all of the options. Certainly having a user fee for people who are using our roads is an obvious and logical way to produce that revenue quickly but I think we have to explore all of the options. Governor Walker came in, made commitments that he was going to solve that problem, and has let all of the proposals sit on his desk for seven years. You have to have a real plan that involves transportation of all types, roads, rail, light rail, ports, airports, you name it, because that's what drives community and economic development. So it's a tool, but there may be other ways to do it as well. Well, speaking of economic development, um, Andy, what uh, one or two actions would you pursue to prevent Wisconsin manufacturing jobs from being lost and to encourage job creation in growth sectors like technology and healthcare? Sure. So I would I build on our strengths. I said in my opening statement that we're really good at food. We're good at water. We have a freshwater initiative, uh, clean air and energy. Those are all industries. Those are all a bundle of industries. We have that uh, infrastructure already in place. Just look at this area with the packaging companies, the machinery, pe people that make machinery, that make papers, that do plastics. If we strive to be the very best in the world, which is exactly where we should be putting our sights, we start to create jobs, good paying jobs in science, technology, manufacturing, and in agriculture. To simply try to put a Foxconn into southeastern Wisconsin that really serves a very narrow niche and it happens without any kinds of revenue guarantees on the, on the part of the state of Wisconsin, makes no sense. It's like trying to reinvent ourselves. Why don't we stick with the things that we're already good at and become great at them? Because when we do, we're gonna be shipping those products, that machinery, that know-how to everybody in the world, and that will create jobs. And Bob, I think you wanted to add something to the entrepreneur, the next generation of entrepreneurs uh, how do we uh, keep them here? And yeah, uh, just briefly, <clears throat> you know, uh, our University of Wisconsin is consistently in the top five for the number of patents produced per year. So why don't we have uh, a lot more startups? You know, why are we dead last in startups? And the reason is, uh, if you're a professor, it's very risky to uh, stop publishing papers and start focusing on a company. You're taking a big risk. And we need to have a culture at our university system that embraces this kind of endeavor and that makes resources available, competitive grants to have uh, the startups attached to research laboratories that turn these technologies directly into Wisconsin businesses so that these technologies aren't just going to these uh, gigantic cor out state corporations and enriching those corporations, but are staying here in Wisconsin and creating new companies that create good paying jobs. And I want to make sure that we have that kind of incubator environment at our universities. When I'm governor. Well, speaking of universities, uh, Bob, what specifically would you do to address the issues of affordable higher education and student loan debt? These are the issues that are uh, often cited by millennials as the most important issues to them. We need to make sure that every, as I did, uh, you know, I went to Stanford and Stanford completely paid uh, for my education. I have no debt. And uh, I want to make sure that every Wisconsin has that kind of opportunity. Um, because it's, it's a common sense policy, right? If you make sure your graduates are ready to take off of their careers and achieve the most success that they possibly can, uh, at least for Stanford, it results in a lot of more donations. It, it does pretty well for them. And really, that's, this is why countries do it. This, and this is why our state of Wisconsin should, should work to achieve this same reality, that every Wisconsin can get through college uh, without having to worry about debt and can achieve uh, their full potential in their careers and create a strong Wisconsin economy. Right. Um, next question is for um, Mike McCabe. So the headlines are um, screaming racism and sexism. 
We want to know what specifically would you do as governor to try to improve equal rights and treatment for women and minorities in Wisconsin? Well, I think first of all we have to understand that a new Jim Crow has been constructed. Uh, once the old Jim Crow was swept away by civil rights legislation in the 1960s, those who supported it got busy constructing a new one that and it stands on, on legs like mass incarceration and voter suppression. And we have to address, we have to address those and cut the legs out from underneath that new Jim Crow. One of the ways we deal with mass incarceration is by addressing drug laws that are ineffective and counterproductive and racially discriminatory. And that's one of the reasons why I favor the full legalization of marijuana. <coughs> We have to, as a state, move toward getting away from the, the war on drugs as it has been fought and understand that what that has done is filled prison cells with people who have committed no violent crime, have damaged no property. We need those people out in their communities supporting families and doing their jobs and contributing to society and paying taxes, not warehousing them in prisons at $30,000. A prisoner for, for taxpayers. Anybody else? I know this is a huge topic for one minute. Does anybody else have something to add? Uh, you're ahead of your time, Bob. Three <laughs> <laughs> questions for you, brother. Um, you know, legalizing marijuana, yes, but there is a deep seated racism in this country that is coming out and coming and, and rearing its ugly head because of President Trump. And Governor Walker has attached himself to President Trump. He initially didn't, but he came out right for him, and now he's right in line with President Trump. Right now, if you're African American, you're black, for President Trump, the answer is more cops. If you're Hispanic or Mexican, it's build a wall. If you're Muslim, it's travel ban. So we have to work like heck to make sure we band together and that we make sure our state, number one, uh, gets out of this crazy place we're in with all this racism bring people together, like everyone I think has said up here, we have to work together on both sides of the aisle, because whether you're Republican or you're Democrat, that shouldn't matter. Racism is racism, and that should not be tolerated in any parts of society. I agree with everything that Milan said. There are specific policies that we can do to address sexism and racism and how they structurally manifest themselves equal pay laws for women, which have been gutted uh, by this government. And it was long past time. My grandmother was fighting for equal pay. I'm 38, this is ridiculous. Wisconsin should not be the worst place to grow up as a black child. That is a moral outrage. And part of it is addressing mass incarceration, but it's also making sure that no matter where you go to school, every child has the same resources, the resources that they need to make that a great school. And the same is true for healthcare. These are public policy questions that can be solved with public policy. The other piece is making sure that we show the moral courage, and it really shouldn't take a lot of courage in 2018, to speak out and name it when it is wrong, and not do what our governor has done, and wink and nod at the president and his racism after Charlottesville, with uh, Roy Moore and the support of a predator for the Senate. Um, and even as he's doing now with Gregard in Missouri, I called on Governor Walker and told him he should try to get Eric Gregard to resign because of his treatment of a woman. It is not hard to ask our leaders to stand up, and I think any one of us on this stage would not be afraid to denounce the racism and misogyny of our current governor and the president. Right. I, I wish we had everybody to weigh in, but um, we will run out if I don't move along. Uh, this it's it's a uh, Malin's time a uh, uh, turn. During the last uh, presidential election, we learned Wisconsin's rural communities felt unrepresented and disenfranchised by the Democratic Party. What can a Democratic governor in Wisconsin do to help connect with those who turned away from the party? Well, there's a lot of things we can do to invest in rural areas. I mean, the first thing is broadband. I mean, let's connect them to the rest of society, the rest of the world, and that in turn will bring uh, opportunities. <laughs> Um, right now, in the state of Wisconsin, rural areas are being hurt. People are leaving in droves. I mean, we're the 10th worst place for people to leave the state this, in, in the country. And they're leaving because there's no opportunities in rural areas. So we need to create opportunities in rural areas just like we need to create them uh, in Milwaukee or Madison or anywhere else. Um, you look at farming. I mean, look what happened in Grant County when you have 
a foreign company, investment company, come in and buy thousands of acres of farms from a family <coughs> farmer and then sell it back to them and have them farm back at crazy prices. I mean, we can't do that. We have to make sure we work for, them. for farmers, our agriculture. When I got on the job in 1997, we had over 23,000 dairy farms. In 2015, that is down to 10,000 dairy farms. That's a problem. We gotta invest in the people in rural areas. We have to create opportunities there just like we have to create them in the inner city of, of other places. We need to invest and create opportunities. Make sure we take care of the people that are here, not just Fox. Right. We will um, go next to Helder Royce. Uh, what, if anything, would you do as governor to restore workers' rights and strengthen unions? Well, I think it's very important that we start treating workers with respect. When Governor Walker took office, the first thing he did was divide and conquer. And what he did was he said, look at these workers, they have something great. And instead of saying, let's make sure that every worker has access to that, he said, let's take it away. And by the way, let's try to divide families in the state from one another. I had a front row seat to that as the Democratic caucus chair. I stood up then and I will stand up now. I think one of the most devastating things that we lost after the passage of Act 10 was not, not just the money that came out of the pockets of those public workers, uh, not just the extra money they had to pay in benefits, they were willing to do that. It was the fact that they lost their voice. They lost the ability to have a conversation in the workplace with their employer, to have their ideas heard. <coughs> they lost the sense of respect and dignity that every worker deserves, no matter whether he or she works in a private or public workplace. As an employer myself, I want to make sure that my employees are well treated because it is hard to find good people. Uh, we want to make sure that people have the rights that they can collectively bargain, and we want to make sure that they have uh, time's up. All right, you know, I'm going to I'm going to add do a quick. Uh, does anybody disagree that Act 10 should be overturned? Would you work for the uh, overturning Act 10 or not, and why or why not? Very very quickly. Just let's go down the line, Michelle. Uh, Act 10 should be overturned. Uh, hamstringing the, you know, removing 20% of take home pay in the largest employer in the state of Wisconsin hurt me as a small business owner. Um, you can have as many entrepreneurs as you want, but if you don't support the local businesses, then you've got nothing. Okay. And as brief as possible, um, Tony others? If it's on my desk, I'll sign it. <laughs> I would overturn Act 10. If anybody's actually read Act 10, many people know about it. It's a taunting document. It's not in good faith. It's done to humiliate teachers, humiliate public employees, do this, do that, treat them like kindergartners. Totally overturned. I'm about moving forward, so I don't look back to restoring. I look forward in restoring the voice of labor at the bargaining table. Collective bargaining is essential. But I don't look at it as something in the rearview mirror. Let's make it better. Let's make it work for our state. Let's make it work for labor. And we will be first. So uh, Republicans are constantly trying to take away money from public schools. Uh, they want to uh, have a different education system for rich kids instead of uh, normal Wisconsinites uh, with the voucher system. And you know, it's no secret that a lot of public school teachers aren't big fans of Republicans. And, and public school teachers support Democrats. Scott, this is nothing more, Act 10 is nothing more than Scott Walker trying to punish and hurt uh, his political opponents. And it's wrong, it's not how we do things in America, and I would immediately repeal it. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, Act 10 is not a sustainable policy and we should work to repeal it. I think the only distinction I would draw between myself and, and the others up here is that it, when we seek repeal, it should be sought as part of a package of reforms that help all working people in every sector of the economy. That is so incredibly important because otherwise we will subject working people again to the divide and conquer tactics that have been used against them, pitting one group of workers against other groups of working people. We need to steer clear of that. And we need to not only be pro-union, we need to be pro-worker. And we need to appreciate that one in ten American workers has union representation. We need to work to get union representation for more people. But we need to fight like crazy for those working people who, who currently lack union representation. And for me, the simple answer is yes. Um, 
You know, during Act 10, if you remember, fire and police were exempt from Act 10, all the changes. And we were told by a Republican legislature, we were told by Governor Walker that we, we want you to sit on the sidelines. We don't want to see you at the protests. We don't want to see you at the rallies. After about a week or so, everybody will realize it's not that bad, and they will go home. But we want you to take your exemption and be quiet. And we not only told him no, but we told him hell no. And we were there with our brothers and sisters marching every day, and we will continue to fight. So I believe, yes, we do repeal, but in all actuality, we need to make sure, like Mike said, and I agree with that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with us agreeing up here, I don't think. We do need to be pro-worker and make sure that everyone has the right to sit down at the table. It's not asking a lot to be able to talk about hours, wages, and working conditions. It's called collective bargaining. That means you sit down with your employer and you talk about what's best, not just for you, but your, you as your employer as well, or your community as well. And we do this all together. We rise together. Can you answer the question already? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I went to Illinois as part of the Wisconsin Senators to stop Act 10. I had to run from that. I'm a very proud member of the Wisconsin 14. But let's look at what's happened since that law passed. Schools can't get teachers. They're passing referenda to be able to increase the pay of teachers. Education students dropped in half. We have huge problems with worker safety in our prisons because we can't, we don't have the systems to resolve grievances like we used to. And worker morale in the state system right now is very low. A recent audit at King, the veterans home, gave us a small glimpse of what's happening in our worker situation in the, in the, in, among state workers. 75% of people who responded to an, an audit survey 75% said that morale was low or very low at King. 40, almost 40% 40 said they would be looking for a job in the next six week, in the next six months. And 25% of them said they already looked for a job. And that's just a snapshot of what's happening all across state government. We have problems with positions being filled. We have problems with applicants. Professors are taking their grant money and moving to states where people respect them, where leaders actually honor the work of professors at our state universities and our tech colleges and our two-year campuses. So we've got a problem. Whoever is the next governor has a big problem they need to solve. And repealing Act 10 is a great place to start. Great, thank you. I would clearly repeal Act 10. Collective bargaining is the only mechanism for people to band together and protect their professions and to make sure that they're <coughs> paid for the work that they do. If you want a vibrant economy, you've got to make sure that the middle class is taken care of and that it's expanded and that people are adequately paid for, for the jobs that they do. Uh, we need to also uh, repeal this right to work legislation that, that Governor uh, pushed through. You know, I don't want to sound like Sarah Palin in any way, but I come from Eau Claire, and you can look to the West, and you can, and you, you, you can, you can see what, uh, what their economy looks like. In Minnesota, uh, the, the, the average family makes $8,000 more per year than Wisconsin. And what's the difference? The difference is they have unions that haven't been attacked. They have policies that believe in people. For individual questions, I think we have Kathy. <coughs> what would you do to ensure that the Wisconsin Department of Resources, Natural Resources, fulfills its mission to protect and enhance our natural resources? Well, first of all, I would hire back all the scientists that the governor fired, and then, would, and then I would ask them to put back on the website that climate change is real, and ask them to post their research on the website so we knew what they were doing. Then I would make sure that the current laws are being enforced. Again, a little nugget from knowledge of knowledge from uh, the audit committee, the, the work of the Legislative Audit Bureau. They found that in some cases, in 95% of the cases in which an order to fix pollution, according to DNR's own rules, was not being enforced. And there's been a big drop off in the number of cases that have been referred to the Department of Justice because polluters consistently refuse to follow the law. 
Right now, the laws are on the books. Many of them have been changed and they need to be repealed. But the laws that are on the books are simply not being enforced. One of the reasons is because the people aren't there anymore. When I asked the DNR at an audit committee hearing, why aren't those CAFOs, those factory farms, being inspected? It was because they didn't have the inspectors. And then in the last budget, they hired two, and they needed 12. Exclamation point. Um, all right, so uh, last question for, for Dana in this segment. Um, what uh, would you do as governor to address the issue of gerrymandering? Do you think this is a big deal? Do you think someone else other than the legislature should draw legislative maps? Uh, yeah, we got one minute for this. So this is I, uh, you know, I, I have been a sponsor of legislation uh, in Madison to implement the Iowa form of uh, redistricting because, uh, uh, you know, it really comes down down to this, do we believe in a republic or do we not believe in a republic? Right now, and there's an interesting, for me it's interesting, but uh, there's, a, there's a law review article written by an attorney named Stephanopoulos, and Stephanopoulos is one of the attorneys that is uh, presently uh, arguing our case before the Supreme Court and, and has been briefing. And uh, this, this, out, this law review, it's the University of Chicago Law Review article, it outlines in great detail the theory behind the case that we have in front of the Supreme Court at this, po at this moment. Now the theory behind this case, this entire case, is, is, tried, is being geared towards convincing Justice Kennedy to do the right thing and save this republic. And let's hope that he does, because this is a serious problem. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, of, of a study that's called the, the Crisis of the Middle Class Constitution, and there's a major question as to whether or not this republic can be saved, because throughout history, every republic has I'm failed. Put a, put, a, put a period on it? All right. <laughs> All right. Um, we are now, we have 15 minutes uh, left in the program, a little less than that. I was going to do a lightning round, and I don't think we're going to have time for it. I will do one question out of the lightning round. This is truly just a yes or no uh, question. Maybe a word or two of clarification if you need. But we will go over time if we don't get more than a yes or no. Should Wisconsin legalize marijuana for medicinal and recreational purposes? Yes. As an MS patient, I firmly agree for both. As medicinal, I'd like to have a referendum on the uh, recreation use. I advocated the legalization about uh, six weeks ago, and I went one step farther today in a forum in Madison. When I am governor, I will pardon everybody in our prison system who's there for marijuana who's in the government. Yes. Yeah. Decriminalize, uh, but not legalize. It's um, unknown exactly the effects of the substance on the body, so I don't want people going to jail for it, but I don't think it's good policy uh, to say it's completely safe. Yes, legalize and tax the legal sales of marijuana. I say yes and tax it appropriately and use all that money derived from uh, legalizing marijuana and go towards the real crisis, which is the opioid crisis, and, and put money to treatment and take care of our people and save them. I say yes as well. Thank you. Thank you. And make sure that we can direct our law enforcement resources where they actually need to be. Uh, which are keeping us safe and not incarcerating people. I strongly support medical marijuana, and I'm a co-sponsor of the bill that's in the legislature right now. If the bill to uh, legalize recreational marijuana came to me after I'd been through the process, I would sign it. I do think we need to put that money towards help for those who are mentally ill and are suffering from addiction. I would say yes, I'd say tax it, and I think we need to develop alternative courts like the treatment uh, court systems that uh, we have in Eau Claire and in Milwaukee increasingly. Uh, these, this is the way we can fund this. We need to treat the underlying problems underneath uh, our, our crime problems, and putting people in, in jail for simple possession of marijuana is ridiculous. It's just $30,000 a year for every single person that's put in there, and you're destroying the family. You're just, you're taking people out of their community needlessly. These are not violent people. Um, 
I should have mentioned earlier that these questions that I've been asking uh, came mostly from uh, party members from Mount Amy and Winnebago uh, County, and they also solicited uh, questions from the community via social media. That was one of the social media uh, questions that we added in. One of the um, issues that the organizers thought was very important to know, is there anything in the Democratic Party of Wisconsin's latest platform that you disagree with? And if so, what is it and why? Um, I guess if you haven't read it, um, why haven't you read it? 30 seconds each. Michelle. Oh, you lost the mic. went down there at the table. Um, I don't know that if I agree or disagree, more that I don't want to just simply... I'm not going to run just based on platforms. I'm not going to play by those rules because I think that we need to be able to open dialogue between people, people who agree and people who disagree, so we can get more people back to the polls. Yeah, I would just say on a, on a global basis, having a platform is really important, but if that plat any part of that platform ends up uh, disrespecting people or disenfranchising people or making people feel less than uh, less than Wisconsinites, I think we need to think through that. The Democratic Party has pushed some people away from it in the past, and I have to, I, I'm just really encouraging Democrats to make sure that that platform embraces all people. I, think that's really important. I was on the party's platform committee before I was chairman. Platforms are very important. There's a moral dimension to government, and it, it, it just breathes in our platform, and it really does not breathe in the Republican platform. We're a party of civil rights and fairness. We're a party of a strong defense. We're also a party of labor rights. We're a party of prosperity. Those are, platforms are aspirational, but I share every one of those. I was the chairman of the party, and uh, platforms are very important. Andy Gronick, you probably figured out I'm not a politician. So when I started this process, I did not know a soul in Wisconsin politics. So the first, the first person I called, I cold called, was Martha Lanning. I said, I'd like to meet with you. I'd like to talk about some ideas I have to try to actually improve the quality of life in our state, to create jobs, to get back to great schools. And I met with her. And I read the platform. And I said, you know what? I know I'm a Democrat. This is how I've lived my life. But what I don't understand is the conversation that Democrats have with business. Business is part of the solution. Labor working together with management towards common goals is how everything great has ever been produced. Thank you. So we have to get back to being able to have a constructive dialogue so that we can move our economy forward. Thank you. I think we put together a tremendous platform and uh, also I know that there are a wide uh, spectrum of views, of course, within the Democratic Party as in any uh, group of people. And I look forward to seeing how we can work together to uh, implement really good ideas that build a strong Wisconsin. My challenge to the Democratic Party has nothing to do with platform, but rather with practice. Uh, I'm the one candidate in this race who was born and raised on a farm. And it troubles me to see Democrats not competing in every part of our state, not contesting races in so many parts of our state. Democrats will not be in a position to govern by writing off rural Wisconsin. And rural Wisconsin has some problems with the Democratic Party today. We must reconnect with rural Wisconsin and rural America if the Democratic Party is going to be in a position to govern and to have our values reflected in public policy again. I don't I don't believe as a Democrat or a liberal you can, or a progressive that you can be scared of who we are. Uh, we need to get away from identity politics. What's wrong with calling yourself a progressive or a liberal? Liberals started Medicare. Liberals are the ones who ended slavery. Liberals started, are the ones who started Social Security. We're the ones who want clean water, clean energy. We're the ones who have women's rights. Liberals are the ones who champion the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. We are who we are. Let's be proud of who we are. Let's go out there and convey our message and talk about economic development, talk about health care, talk about education. But let's not be scared or run away from who we are. The urban-rural divide, it may be out there. We've got to bridge the gap and bring people together. And everything we've done 
Conservatives or Republicans have been against it every step of the way, but we have won because we have the people. I was waiting for you to say exclamation <laughs> and I'm from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. I think uh, we have an extraordinary big tent, and I think that's a good thing, because you can't win in states uh, like Wisconsin unless you're willing to do that. And you ultimately cannot govern with the best of ideas if you're unwilling to listen to people with whom you disagree. That said, I think a lot of the uh, resolutions that are passed in these committees sometimes tend to be prescriptive, and if you're a governor, I think you have to be open to numerous ways of doing things. So uh, while I agree with the <coughs> ultimate goals, like health care for all, I'm very open to doing whatever it takes to move us along the path, because I know that every single decision that our governor makes is going to affect the lives of Thank real you. people. Yeah. I was county chair for seven years, uh, county democratic chair for seven years, um, before I became a, a senator. And I struggled with a small rural county. I come from a county of 13,000, counting the dogs and the cats. And <laughs> for so long, we had a difficult time working with the Democratic Party to help uh, a, an urban-dominated party realize that if we're going to control the legislature, we have to win in my neighborhood. We have to win in rural areas. And many times, when, when I argued on the Platform and Resolutions Committee, it was to say, you know, this stuff is really important, but it's also really important that DNR inspect sand mines, because they're polluting our water and our air, and the poor horse apples died of arsenic poisoning because of that, that sand mine that released stuff into the water. So it, it, it takes a balance, really. I think generally I agree with everything in the uh, in the platform. I'm thinking hard through it. I was there when it was enacted in the last uh, at the last convention. I was there at the national convention as well. And I and there's a lot in it, and I I'm pretty darn sure I agree with all of it. But I agree with my colleagues here that we we have to win in these rural communities. We have to start bringing people back. Uh, Dave Obi endorsed me. Uh, some time ago, and he, he represented the 7th Congressional District for 40 years. And we've strayed from labor in some respects, and we've strayed from regular folks in some respects. So with that caveat, I, I think overall I do agree with the, the policy. I'm a lifelong progressive, but I, I would want to look through that and make darn sure that we're, we're providing for uh, local voter, uh, region, uh, rural voters as well. All right, we have four minutes to go. We're going to um, start on... Um Dana's end and, and very, very quickly uh, go uh, in this direction. If you do not win the primary, will you or how will you actively support the winning candidate? Well, I, I believe I will win the primary, but if I don't, I, I can tell you this. I have been active in the Democratic Party since I was 10 years old. I will bust my tail to make sure, if I'm not the nominee, I will bust my tail to make sure that that nominee wins. We have to win. Do you realize that this governor, the next governor, is going to be an integral part of redistricting? And if we, you know, how many times have we had politicians stand up here and say this is the most important election ever? Well, this one is, because we can't have him in that seat when there's redistricting again. We just can't do it. We will be Mississippi if that happens. I will definitely support Blue Ranch, and I'm confident that we will win. I want to tell you though, I did the same thing in 2012 when you, some of you know that I ran and Tom Barrett won and I took him all over western Wisconsin and I took him to radio interviews and I said, Tommy, people are really concerned about this. And he <coughs> just, God bless him, he, he had a hard time talking rural. And we have to figure out how to bring rural people in into our party in order to win statewide. There just are not enough votes. The math isn't there. So whoever wins, let's reach out to everybody in our state. Yes, I will enthusiastically support our party's nominee. I believe it will be me because if we're going to win, we need to attract young voters, Gen X and millennials. We need to attract independent and Republican leading women. And uh, I will lend my beautiful campaign baby to whoever the nominee is. If necessary. <laughs> I already have my own kids. I don't need any more babies. 
I love you, baby is cute though, I'm sorry. Um, with me, hashtag winning. I mean, we have to win this. And yes, I will support anybody up here. Uh, I can talk rule. I actually, I was born in Milwaukee, but I grew up in Delvin, Wisconsin. And if you don't know, I graduated from the same high school as uh, Governor Walker. Now, we obviously took some different classes. <laughs> we learned some different lessons. But yes, I'm going to support whoever's up here. But whatever votes I get in the primary, I hope it, it puts me over the top. But if it doesn't, I'm going to support whoever up here goes across that finish line because we have to win. That's all that matters to me. Is I've grown quite fond of the people who are up here, and we've had so many forums <laughs> together. All I can tell you is that I will not stop working after August 14th, regardless of the outcome, and I won't stop working for a new politics and for a government that works for all of us after November 6th either, regardless of the outcome. I'm going to continue to be out there in the trenches working for the kind of politics that we need that puts regular people in the driver's seat of our government. I have confidence that somebody on the stage tonight is going to be the next governor of Wisconsin, and uh, we're going to do it the same way that Patty won. We're going to make lots and lots of phone calls, and we're going to go door to door, and we're going to make sure that everyone in the state of Wisconsin who wants change, who wants a better future for Wisconsin, gets out to vote in November of this year. Thanks, Andy Gordon. Let's make a comment about this rural city thing. It's not about where you're from, it's about what you stand for. It's about what we all stand for in this room. And I'll tell you as someone who spoke to 700 people in 18 months, what everybody has in common in this state is they don't think anybody's listening. Well, I'm listening. I think we're listening. So, out of the words of a friend of mine who's a Navy SEAL, teamwork is about looking out after the person to the left and to the right. So believe me, I am a team player. If I'm not your next governor, I'll be looking out for the people on my left and for the people on my right. I will support any Democratic nominee. I'm hoping it's myself. I think we need an, an aggressive candidate to take on Scott Walker. But on our ship, we have people from Mississippi, Wyoming, New York, and Wisconsin. We're all one people. In Wisconsin, we're not rural and we're not urban. We are one Wisconsin people. And I will fight very, very hard for anybody to beat Scott Walker. First, I'll support any candidate that wins the primary. It's going to be me. We're in a good position. Uh, we're in a good position to win this race. Recent polling shows us we're, we're, we're ahead of the field here. This is a real important race. We will beat Scott Walker next November. Thank you very much. not afraid to stand up to the big scary man in the suit so we can't win we will win if we don't win none of our policies or platform or anything and all the good we want to do matter so that's what matters most wisconsin matters so whoever comes out front i will respect democracy and respect the voters and of course i'm 100 percent behind them thank you all very much People can mill out there for another half hour or so. And uh, thank you and uh, good luck.